Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is so great to be back at Viola, to be welcomed back by President Corey and Craig Hazen. I was here six years ago moderating with my back turned you a debate, a memorable debate. It's on YouTube between Dr. William Lane Craig and the late Christopher Hitchens. Hitch was a friend of mine. I interviewed him more than 70 times, but that was one of the most memorable evenings that I had ever spent with him or had seen him debate. And he began it by saying, here we are in the den of lambs. And I said tonight at a gathering of, uh, of supporters of the university that lambs sometimes have teeth and can bite. And, uh, and that was, in fact, what happened uh, six years ago. Tonight's a little bit different. I'm going to jump right in because we will not have enough time with these three wonderful individuals. But one prefatory note, uh, I'm here tonight and doing this event because J.P. Moreland took one of those Biola events to Mariner's Church 25 years ago. And I went and listened to it. I'm a Christian. But I hadn't been taught how to do this. And that's what Biola teaches you how to do. And the apologetics program here is simply extraordinary. And if you're watching anywhere in the world, take advantage of the resources online. And if you can get to this wonderful campus, do so. Hashtag God Science. If you're part of the participants, I'll be checking it. I'm going to start with a news story that if you three gentlemen had listened to the radio show with William Craig, uh, with uh, uh, Craig Hazen two nights ago, you would know it was coming. This is from The Guardian. So I'm going to begin with you, uh, doctor. Uh, the headline says, Skull discovery suggests location where humans first had sex with Neanderthals. Skull found in northern Israeli cave in western Galilee, thought to be female and 55,000 years old, connects interbreeding and moved from Africa to Europe. Ian Sample, the science editor, says, an ancient skull found in the cave has cast light on the migration of modern humans out of Africa and the dawn of humanity's colonization of the world. Now, I am proving, of course, Biola is not afraid of the Guardian, or of science, or of discovery, but I am curious, Dr. Lennox, what is your reaction to not only the discovery, but the way it is presented and what it says to your worldview? Well, that's the first I've heard of it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sufficiently skeptical to say they'll be saying something different next week. Um, the whole question of the antiquity of human beings and the nature of human beings is a question that, from my mind, raises an in-principle issue that needs to be settled first. Because we don't settle humanity from bone shapes, all this kind of thing. And I'm a bit of a radical skeptic here, possibly because I'm a mathematician. <clears throat> but it seems to me that physicists are very content to believe in a singularity at the beginning of space-time. That is something supernatural. Christians, like me, believe in a singularity at the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is not explicable in purely naturalistic terms. And I see no reason not to believe that there are several other singularities of this kind, one of them at the origin of life and another at the origin of human life. Now, in order to detail that, we'd have to spend the whole evening on that particular topic. But I watch this. I'm not a, an expert paleontologist at all, and I'm interested in what they say. But it seems to me that <clears throat> the basic presupposition that underlines so much is naturalism, that there's a complete uniformity of explanation from the simple to the complex. And I do not think that is the case. William Lane Craig, your reaction to the story, the discovery, and the worldview entailed in it? I'm not an anthropologist or biologist. Let me address it as a theologian. I don't have any difficulty in thinking that human beings interbred with Neanderthals. Why not, as long as they were biologically able to do so? I remember talking to a Christian geneticist uh, some time ago, who said to me, you carry Neanderthal DNA in your own body. Um, so what's the problem theologically with saying that this may have happened? I, even if this is a case of bestiality occurring, we know that that occurs among human beings. So theologically, I guess I don't see the problem. My difficulty with the story 
would be, as you say, the way it was presented. This is the first time that human beings had sex with Neanderthals. Uh, it sounds like a soap opera. Obviously, they're going here for the headline value, the sensationalism of it, and, and so forth. And it seems to me that that's typical of the way the press handles science. JP, uh, an atheist, would sit down and throw this at you and say, see? To which you would respond. Well, first of all, I'd respond that these kinds of questions are not the proper order if you're going to address the question of God, is there a God or is Christianity true? These are questions that are within the system, uh, and what you have to do is really address the fundamental questions about the system itself. Any system is going to have some difficulties around the borders of that system. That's true for any major paradigm in any discipline in the university. So I would take the question back to the existence of God and facts about Jesus' life. But now to go back to the question, again, I'll, I'll admit that I'm not a paleontologist, but um, I think a lot, of this, a lot of these claims are based on a very slim amount of inf data and information. I don't think the data set is as large as, as a lot of people think it. As people knew how small it was. They'd be, I think, surprised. I think uh, the major question for us is preserving a real Adam and Eve, and I think that that can be done, and uh, it has been argued. John Bloom has made a tremendous case for that uh, genetically. Uh, so uh, I'm inclined to agree with Bill uh, but I, I would want to say that if someone was going to make this a matter of this proving that there wasn't an Adam and Eve, I'd like to see how that follows from this, because I don't think that follows. Three apologists, three people unthreatened by cultural discoveries or antiquities or anthropology. I am pondering Buddhism right now. All right. <laughs> William Lane Craig, second question. Among the Academy Award-nominated films is one on the life of Stephen Hawking. A lot of people think they know what Hawking believes. A lot of people believe that Hawking has done away with the need for Biola's apologetics program and has made science and faith irreconcilable. What is it that Hawking believes, and what do you think people ought to believe what it is that he believes? The most interesting line in that film is when his wife-to-be, Jane, asks him, what is cosmology? He told her he's a cosmologist, and he says, cosmology is a religion for intelligent atheists. That's a terribly interesting definition. Modern cosmology for the atheistic scientist does provide a kind of metaphysical alternative to God. The multiverse becomes a kind of God surrogate that explains the fine tuning of the cosmos. It explains the origin of the universe. It really does fill a sort of religious or metaphysical function for some of these thinkers. In the case of Hawking, he has made statements that suggest that he's either an agnostic, that he doesn't believe God exists, or even more strongly, that he is an actual atheist, that he thinks that God does not exist. But so far as I know, he's not provided any argument to support his atheism. He simply said that he doesn't see any need for a creator of the universe, but that obviously isn't a proof that there is no such being. Dr. Lennox, you want to comment on us? I do, yes. <laughs> <laughs> because Stephen Hawking was just ahead of me at Cambridge. I, I can remember him quite well, though I didn't know him. And I was rather amused that when the Times interviewed him and asked him about religion, he said, religion is a fairy story for people afraid of the dark. And I was asked to comment, so I said, atheism is a fairy story for people afraid of the light. Huh. <laughs> <clears throat> now, <laughs> it's very kind of you to clap, but that proves nothing. <laughs> because... That's a great line. We're not anti-applause. No, 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 no. no, 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 no. <laughs> One of the things you learn in the world that I work, and it's very important, is that a statement by a scientist is not necessarily a statement of science. Amen. Now, what amazes me about Hawking, who's a genius, obviously, is the heart of his book with Leonard Mladenov, The Grand Design. The key statement is this. <clears throat> because there is a law of gravity, 
The universe can and will create itself from nothing. What? <laughs> because there is a law of gravity, because there is something, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. That's a flat contradiction. Secondly, because there is a law of gravity, he doesn't even say that gravity exists, but what would a law of gravity mean if there's no gravity? Worse still, the universe can and will create itself. If I say to you, X creates Y, roughly speaking, if you've got X, you'll get Y. If I say X creates X, well, if you've got X, you'll get X. And what does that mean? It means that nonsense remains nonsense, even if scientists are writing it. Mm. <laughs> so I was staggered that this is the key argument of his book. I would suggest that nobody with an undergraduate education in philosophy read that book before he published it. Huh. Because what he's reduced the whole thing to, and it's ironic, it's God or nothing now. Either God creates the universe or nothing does. And um, <clears throat> he gets into complications in the definition of nothing. But I was very fortunate in having a debate with Alan Guth, the father of modern cosmology at the MIT Harvard Faculty Club. And I said to him in this very friendly debate, I said, Alan, people are very confused about nothing out there. <laughs> so I said, look, you can help us. When you, as an astrophysicist, talk about nothing, you do not mean nothing That's right. in the philosophical sense of absence of anything. He said, no, we don't. Okay. I said, thank you very much. That's right. Exactly right. So the point is that these people are claiming to get a universe from nothing, but they're failing to do it. And the most amusing of all, I must tell you this, I, how would you like this if it was submitted to you? Lawrence Krauss, astrophysicist, because something is physical, nothing must be physical, especially if you define it as the absence of something. <laughs> I mean, that is utter absurdity, and it's on about page four of his book. Now, the point is, and Bill is the world expert on this, so I'll stop now, that the standard model of the universe leads you with a start from nothing. And they're having a great problem to get a universe from nothing, so they redefine nothing. As a Christian, I don't believe the universe came from nothing. I believe it came from God, but God is not physical. Amen. You're going yeah. awfully fast, Dr. Lennox, for lawyers and Pittsburgh Steelers fans. Shall I say it again? <laughs> no. But I want to ask JP to help me. Um, yep. And by the way, JP, it's a contradiction. We're here at a university, Christian university, led by a president, President Corey, who's a New England Patriots fan, culture of corruption in New England. You know, no question it, it, about it. So There's no question about it. How does Biola, with a Christian mission, reconcile the scientific challenge? That's why we're here. Yeah. Let's get right to it. How does Biola do that, maintaining the standards it does, turning out great scientists, doctors, nurses, physical scientists? How does it do that with what must confuse our secular and perhaps atheist friends, how it's possible to do both? Well, uh, Roderick Chisholm, who is a philosopher of the last century at Brown University, one of my favorite philosophers, uh, distinguished two different senses of the right to be sure. Uh, in one sense, a person has the right to be sure if they have completely foreclosed a question and they're 100% sure they're right, so they need to, don't need to look at any further arguments. The second <clears throat> notion of a right to be sure is that I take myself to actually know this thing in question, though I will agree I could possibly be wrong, and I'm willing to look at further evidence against my view, but I'm not going to do it with a mindset of being 50-50. I take myself to know this, but my knowledge is defeasible. That is to say, it's open to being defeated, or there could be evidence against it. And I think it's the second right to be sure uh, that, that is required in a Christian university uh, to explore things. I, I take myself uh, to have a body of knowledge, not beliefs, but a body of knowledge from Scripture, uh, and uh, especially with regard to the core commitments of mere Christianity. I don't take this to just be truths. I take it to be truths that I know to be true. And then I take a look at the best 
literature that's against what I believe. I look, try to find arguments in favor of it with my students. And if they, if they can find something that's been written against a particular view I, on my specialties, neuroscience and the soul, we'll, we'll read it and talk about it. And um, I, my assumption is that if what I take, what if I take myself to know to be true, it's going to be okay in the long run. And, uh, you know, we've been doing this a long time. And I, and I will tell you something, Hugh, that's very, very ironic. Uh, you will find that on this campus, we do more to read and study and interact with people who don't agree with us than people in a lot of secular campuses who read top-notch Christian literature and interact with that. So you're going to get a much more balanced education here than UCLA or a lot of other places. Well, Lynn Craig, um, I've had interaction, interviewed uh, Dawkins, Dr. Dawkins, Professor Dawkins. You've debated Christopher Hitchens. I'm pretty sure Hitch would have said, and I think Dr. Dawkins would say, the idea of a Christian university is itself an oxymoron. Is it, in fact, an oxymoron to have a Christian, which presupposes belief, and university, which is premised on inquiry? Well, not if Christianity is true, obviously. <laughs> if Christianity is true, then of course a person can explore all of the different facets of God's world that are studied at the university. And we're convinced that Christianity is true, that this is a, a view of life and the world that makes sense out of the data of human experience. And we're certainly open-minded to read and interact with literature of opposing points of view, but at the end of the day, we're convinced that Christianity is true. And so, of course, a uh, Christian university with that sort of perspective is possible and viable. So, Dr. Lennox, when I had Dr. Dawkins on, he said, so you really believe Jesus turned water into wine? That's what he went to. And I said, yes. He said, you really believe that Jesus turned water into wine? I said, yes. He said, really? And I said, yes. And he said, oh, my God. And I said, no, my God. Right? <laughs> well, but his, his, he was fundamentally convinced it was not possible to be logical and Christian. I'm sure you ran into that when you debated him. Tell the audience about that occasion and how you interact with the new atheists. Oh, I did. But, you know, in your previous question, it's very funny. Um, the idea of a Christian university being an oxymoron, that means that both Oxford and Cambridge are oxymorons. <laughs> because Christianity gave us the universities. Yeah. Our well, intellectual... You can include Harvard yes. and Princeton? Yes. Well, in that list. Yes, Harvard came from my college at Cambridge, actually. <laughs> <laughs> oh, big footing oh, by all the are we? Okay. <laughs> but, but, but anyway, it was, it was quite amusing when I encountered... Um, Richard Dawkins on a broadcast that was never broadcast. He, he, <laughs> he um, plowed into me about this water into wine. And I said, Richard, look, if Jesus was the Son of God, he invented water, so turning it into wine wasn't a big deal. <laughs> but the point is that what he's reacting against, and I had this with Hitch in public, uh, Hitch was saying, you know, you can't possibly believe in miracles as a scientist because David Hume has shown long ago that miracles are a violation of the laws of nature. What I discover with people like Dawkins and co, they won't investigate the Christian evidence. Why? Because they've decided in principle that miracles are impossible. In other words, they bought into David Hume. Now, I happen to believe that David Hume is false and demonstrably false. And, but you have to overcome that at first. And it is very sad to me that Dawkins, who shouts loudest for evidence, doesn't seem to be remotely interested in it. Because when I put it to him, I said, well, uh, how did you get on when you studied the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus? He said, I don't know how anybody could be remotely interested in it. Well, that's not Are scholarly. You? That's anti-intellectual. But perhaps that's not answering your question. No, it is. What it, was it, the... the... The question is, when you confront a new <coughs> atheist and they say it is impossible to approach a university from a Christian perspective because it presupposes the truth of the resurrection, I think Bill answered it in one respect, is we believe it to be true after investigation. Oh, yes. Oh, okay, let me say something about that. Um, 
the interesting thing these days, I, I give a lot of lectures on science and God, and one of the provocative things I say is that science has not buried God, but science is doing a very good job of burying atheism. And the reason for that is, and I think it's extremely important, is that C.S. Lewis saw it years ago, that we do brilliant science because we think, but what we haven't done is think about thinking. And the status of thought in the atheist worldview is very questionable. I mean, sometimes I have fun with my colleagues in Oxford, and I say, what do you do science with? And they say, I've got a, I've got a machine worth a billion dollars. I said, I don't mean that, I mean this. Oh, you mean my, and they nearly say mind, and then they remember that there's no mind, there's just a brain. And <clears throat> So they say, um, I do it with my brain. I say, tell me about your brain. Do you want the long story? No, the short story. Okay, then, the short story is, my brain is the end product of a mindless, unguided process. And I say to them, and you trust it? <laughs> now, that's the jokey way of putting it, although it irritates a lot of intelligent people. Uh, but Thomas Nagel, who's a, a world-class philosopher, has come out with a fascinating book, Mind and Cosmos, Why the Neo-Darwinian View of the Universe is Almost Certainly False. And he's simply making the point that if you take the reductionist view of thinking and reduce it to physics and chemistry, you empty rationality out of all possible meaning. In other words, I claim that science, the very fact that I can do mathematics, is one of the most powerful evidences that there's a mind behind the universe. In other words, science is burying atheism. So the shoe's on the other foot. I want to follow up on that. The most widely linked to Wall Street Journal editorial, probably since it went online, was by our friend Eric Metaxas, <coughs> and it occurred within the last 30 days after the publication of his book, Miracles, in which he said the evidence that science is producing is pointing overwhelmingly to a creator and a created order. William Lane Craig, do you agree that the march of science is doing that? I didn't read McTaxis's article. I saw an interview with him on CNN. I was a little distressed, frankly, Hugh, at the superficiality of the interview that I saw. It that's, didn't that's seem to me... That's what journalists do, Bill. That's what we... <laughs> I, I would prefer to be more careful, or I think you open yourself up to the charge of God of the gaps. That is to say, you're just using God to plug loopholes in our scientific knowledge. Here's how I would put it. I think that science can provide evidence for a premise in a philosophical argument for a conclusion having theological significance. That is to say, you can have a philosophical argument, say, for a cosmic designer, and science will provide evidence for one of the key premises in that argument. So you're not using science to prove God uh, in the sense of the God of the gaps kind of reasoning, but you're appealing to scientific evidence to support one of the premises in your argument. For example, that the universe began to exist, or that the fine-tuning of the universe is not due to chance or physical necessity, religiously neutral statements that can be supported by science, and then in conjunction with other premises, these will imply a conclusion that will have very great theological significance, like there is a cosmic designer, or there is a personal creator of the universe, or something of that sort. So, JP, was Eric wrong to suggest this argument exists and is finding an audience? Is, was he putting forward a God of the Gaps? Well, I, I didn't hear the interview either or, or read the paper, but I, I, I wouldn't say he was wrong. I would say he was not careful and wasn't stating it the right way. Uh, so I think that if he would put it a little bit more carefully, like, like Bill has done, that science can provide evidence for a premise, like that the universe began to exist, that could be a part of an argument with the conclusion there's a God. I think that's that's the best way to go about it. By the way, I want to go back to the miracles thing for a second. Um, you, might, uh, you might want to take a look at Craig Keener's uh, hernia-inducing two-volume set uh, that, that covers maybe 1,400 pages, 
where he, and he is one of the most detailed researchers I know, and he has documented uh, evidence that there are miracles happening around the world and have been in the name of Jesus. And uh, it's pretty hard uh, to take a look at the work he's done on that and to dismiss it all as though none of this happened. I think most people in an average church have seen or know of a miracle that's happened among their people, an answer to prayer that it's very hard to be explained, a healing of some kind. Uh, so I think that miracles continue to happen, but I think atheists aren't willing to come to church and sit with folk and to say, tell me about your story, and how did you know that was a miracle? Because some of the claims that it was a miracle are not solid, they're, they're too quick. But there is a residue of those out there. There are people in this room who've seen things happen that I think are not explicable rationally without postulating that God did it in answer to prayer, whatever it might be. So I think these things didn't just happen in Jesus' day, and nobody up here is saying that. Um, but I think that they continue to happen, and, and it's all you have to do is go out and talk to people. By the way, I'll tell you a miracle that's happened tonight. Twice John Lennox has demonstrated by his humor that the Brits don't have to be stuffed shirts all the time. <laughs> and I think that that's, that right, that's a miracle right there. <laughs> Not because he's Irish, really. No, that yeah. doesn't count. <laughs> Dr. Lennox. Sorry about that. <laughs> I, I think Bill here has said something very important. Um, two things, actually, and I, I'd like to emphasize them. The first is, we use the word proof too carelessly. Proof, in its rigorous sense, only occurs in my field of mathematics. And logic. Proof in the more informal sense, that is evidence, pointers, um, occurs everywhere and in the natural sciences. So we're not talking about proof in that logical sense, axioms, logic, conclusion. But the second thing is the God of the gaps. You see, <clears throat> one of the things Stephen Hawking has is shaken many young people because of his status as a scientist, arguably the most famous living scientist. And what he's essentially saying to young people is, you must choose between science and God. Now, I have a whole lot of answers to why that results from a confusion about science, but not long ago, it occurs to me that at the heart of it is a profound confusion about the nature of God. What I mean by that is this. Stephen Hawking thinks that I believe in a God of the gaps. That is, I can't explain it, therefore God did it. Now follow this carefully because I feel this is very important. If you define God to be a God of the gaps, that is a placeholder, I can't explain it, science will one day explain it, then you've got to choose between God and science because that's the way you've defined God. And when in our conversation and public discourses we don't make clear what we're talking about, we'll be shooting past each other because Hawking's idea of our God is the kind of Greek God of lightning who will disappear in the first course of astrophysics. So this is a crucial insight, I think, to see that we must be clear what we mean by the God we're talking about. I want to come back to this. I also want to go to our first question from the web. And again, if you're watching online, you can follow the conversation online at hashtag God science. Uh, Daniel Simpson tweets in JP. JP Moreland, is a historical Adam and Eve compatible with evolution? I.e., maybe they weren't the first humans. Well, uh, I, as an historical Adam and Eve is compatible with the theory of evolution. Uh, if you have uh, evolution generating uh, a, a, a homo sapien or a human, male and female, at the same time. If, on the other hand, you have the standard story that's going on now, that Eve was generated uh, through evolution at one time and Adam was generated 100,000 or 150,000 years later, I don't think that's compatible with the biblical account, nor do I think it's required to believe it based on the evidence. Doug Axe has written some things uh, 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 defending an alternative to that view, 
And so uh, when I come across something like this, uh, what I do is to say, okay, uh, science or philosophers or, or someone is making a claim about this that seems to cut against what I understand the Bible to be teaching. So I go back and I see if I rethink if I've understood the Bible correctly. Is this important? It seems to be in this case. And so I ask, are there thoughtful people that know these issues that are well-educated defending a traditional side? And if there is, then I, then I say, why then do we need to go to uh, a, a side that is contrary to Christianity when there are well-informed people, perhaps they're in the minority, but they're doing their homework defending the traditional view. And so the fact that they're in the minority, I explain sociologically, because I think people are socialized, and Thomas Kuhn pointed this out a long time ago, and not everything about his was good, but I think this was a legitimate point, that when, when people are taught science, they're sociologized into a way of doing it through their textbooks, and their professors, and it's very difficult sometimes to consider an alternative way of viewing a major theory or paradigm. So it doesn't bother me if it's a minority as long as it's credible, and that's, that's how I approach that. Uh, Bill, I want to go back to the God of the Gaps, because my friend McTaxis is throwing something at the internet right now, because I may have misstated, and I want to make sure I state his argument correctly. In the Wall Street Journal, it was that there is significance in the silence, that human beings have been looking for extraterrestrials to talk to us for a long time, and we hear nothing and we see nothing, and all the coefficients that exist and all the variables that must exist to make this planet the way it is are indicative of a creator. What do you think of that argument? I think it's extremely interesting in the sense that one, many have argued that if there is intelligent extraterrestrial life, they ought to be here already. We ought to have evidence of it. And since we don't, that suggests that there is no such extraterrestrial intelligent life anywhere else in the observable universe. I'm more interested, however, in the fine tuning of the universe that is necessary for the evolution and existence of intelligent life anywhere in the cosmos, not just on Earth. That argument would be an argument that the Earth is specially created in such a way as to be life-sustaining. Do you find that but persuasive? I, I find it persuasive in the sense that it simply layers more improbability onto the fine-tuning of the initial conditions of the cosmos to begin with. If the initial conditions of the universe are so incomprehensibly improbable that the universe ought to be life prohibiting, then this additional improbability that results from the Earth's um, narrowly defined parameters for life simply layers on more and more improbability and therefore in that sense I think is, is persuasive. Now Dr. Lennox, there are stupid questions and I'm about to ask one. Um, you're a mathematician, an accomplished mathematician. By, Doesn't, by the way, do you know what the biggest evidence for extraterrestrial life is? No. That they haven't contacted us. <laughs> <laughs> Charles Grotheimer <laughs> argues that it's, it's evidence Sorry. that when you get to our level, you blow yourself up. Okay. Um, <clears throat> always the new atheists say infinity answers everything. You're a mathematician. I've Infinite never, possibilities answer everything. What do you say to that? I've never heard an atheist say that. But uh, what you probably mean is that in the days before they believed in a finite time backwards to space-time or whatever, mm. that they thought that given infinite time, whatever that means, uh, plus chance you'd get anything. But that's gone now. I don't find people making that argument. But perhaps if you make it a bit more precise in some area... I no, I'm a lawyer. I don't do that. Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> never make anything... Bill, let, let's bring Bill in. One, one area that comes up would be one I've alluded to already, the appeal <coughs> to the multiverse. Yes. yes. The multiverse you, doesn't Bill. need to be don't infinite be in time. No as long as you have an infinite number That's of parallel worlds, universes in this world ensemble, and by multiplying your 
probabilistic resources, you increase the chances to one of having intelligent life somewhere in that world ensemble. If you have many roulette wheels spinning at the same time, you're much more likely to get the, the winning number than if it's just one wheel. So That's the, what I understand atheists to be arguing now. Yes, I, I think that at least with respect to the design argument, honestly, this is where the heart of the controversy is today. It, it is design versus the world ensemble or multiverse hypothesis, versus which infinity. are two metaphysical hypotheses, extraordinary metaphysical hypotheses that, that are at the heart of the debate over this today. And so how does one prefer one of those premises over the other? Well, I would say two things about that. First, I would say that whereas we have independent evidence for the existence of God, we have no independent evidence of the existence of a world ensemble or multiverse, much less that it's infinite in number and randomly ordered. George Ellis, who is probably the world's most famous cosmologist, University of uh, South Africa in Cape Town, has said that we cannot and do not have either direct or indirect evidence of other worlds, of multiverse scenarios. They're, they are metaphysical in nature. But secondly, there's this tremendous objection that faces multiverse explanations that Roger Penrose at Oxford University has raised, namely this, that a world in which just a tiny patch of order exists, enough for our existence, say the size of the solar system, is incomprehensibly more probable than a finely tuned universe. Um, and therefore, in the world ensemble, if we are just a random member of that world ensemble, we ought to be observing a universe like that tiny patch of order, because there are simply vastly and comprehensibly more universes that are observable like that than finely tuned universes. So the fact that we don't have those sorts of observations strongly disconfirms the multiverse hypothesis. Now, I I'm fairly certain that this audience and the online audience wants this explained in depth. They want to understand the multiverse response. So JP and, okay. and, and, and John, yeah. I want you both to take a whack at okay. it. Okay, so the, the problem for the atheist is that we've discovered uh, that there are a number of uh, constants of nature and other factors that, have, that are fine-tuned. And what that means is that their physical magnitude, let's say the charge on an electron, if it were slightly larger or slightly smaller on the order of a very small percentage change either way, you can't get any kind of life uh, in the universe. So that um, when you add these factors up, there are several of them, um, it becomes extremely improbable in a mind-boggling kind of way that this universe could have just happened by chance and be a life-permitting universe. It looks like, as one person put it, that the dice were rigged ahead of time so that life could take place. And by the way, we do explain things like that all the time. We find improbable things that come together and we will often explain them as the result of personal agency. Uh, so pers uh, uh, the action of a personal agent can explain uh, situations like that. Now, if you want to avoid that solution, what you want to postulate is that there is an infinite number of parallel universes. And you might want to think about it like this. Suppose that you went into a room and it was a universe-generating room and you knew that this room generated universes, and you noticed that there were 30 dials in the room, and they were huge, and each dial had 10,000 settings on it, but on each dial there was just a hairline where it was colored black. And in order for a universe to, to permit life, the dial had to be, each of those 30 dials had to be set on its black, place, and if it were set anywhere else, there's no life. And you came in and looked at that room, 
and you saw all those dials with the myriads of possibilities for them to be set in different places, and they were all set in just the right place for life to appear, you'd say this was done on purpose. But the, but the multiverse allows us to say, well, there are, there's going to be an infinite number of worlds, and so we can vary the charge on an electron from one world to the next, same with a mass of a proton, and sooner or later, you're going to get a world just because of the probabilities where there's going to be life there. And it's not surprising that we're in that world, because if we weren't in that world, <laughs> we'd be dead and wouldn't be talking about it. And there are other problems that, that, that with the multiverse theory. I think Bill's two are, are really, really good ones, but it's got additional problems. And I want to make sure that you speak to the multiverse problem, Dr. Lennox, or the, or the answer that has been provided. Well, my instinctive reaction is it is the biggest violation of the principle of Occam's razor we've ever seen. <laughs> in other words, that principle that we normally use in science and in our investigation that we keep the number of hypotheses as small as possible. Huh. And I was taught quantum physics at Cambridge by John Polkinghorne, who's been all his life an extreme skeptic of this kind of thing. And I'm interested that even Sir Martin Rees, our astronomer royal, who's written a book about this, and he talks about some people, like Polkinghorne, believe in a creator. And then he says, I prefer to believe in a multiverse. Right. Now, that's not a scientific statement. The other thing is, we need to be careful of a false alternative. Because Max Tegmark, who was one of the early proposers at Princeton of the multiverse theory, said there's either a god or a multiverse. But logically, that's false, of course. God can create as many universes as he likes. And a book I know moderately well seems to indicate there's more than this one. Speaking of books, <coughs> I want to take the opportunity to ask the question that, that I heard. Remark? It's uh, a book I know. Uh, the Bible seems to indicate there's more than this one. Oh! <laughs> you are about to... Philosopher... <laughs> Philosophers don't read the Bible. Okay. I, just... I, should, I should also say... I should also say that one of Stephen Hawking's co-workers is a Canadian Christian, a distinguished professor of physics called Don Page. And when I was writing my little book about Stephen Hawking, in which I talk a little bit about the multiverse, I, I wrote to him. And it was very interesting what he said. He gave me permission to reproduce it. But he's a believer, a Christian, and he believes in the multiverse theory. So it's not an alternative God or the multiverse. No. So no matter what you believe about it, you can't deduce the non-existence of God from it. Actually, I think theism is the best hope yes. for the existence of a multiverse. Yes. Because, as you say, an omnipotent God could create as many universes as yeah. he wants. But <clears throat> on naturalism, it is highly, highly improbable that we should be observing a finely tuned universe. It is incomprehensible. Would you explain the term naturalism for the benefit of... No, uh, atheism. Think of the Steelers fans atheism. always. Okay. If there's no God, then it is incomprehensibly more probable, if we are a random member of a multiverse, that we ought to be observing a, a world that is just a tiny patch of order that permits us to observe it, rather than an entire universe that's fine-tuned, because those little tiny patches are simply incomprehensibly more probable than finely-tuned universes. So if you throw a dart at the observable universes in the multiverse, in all probability, you're going to hit a very tiny patch of order, not a world like this. Let me ask uh, Dr. Lennox, because many people know your biography from having read that you're a mathematician, you're a linguist, you're an accomplished scholar, you're a fellow at a graduate school at Oxford. Why have you written a book on Daniel that is about to appear? First, what's the title of the new book? It's called Against the Flow. Daniel... Um, now, what is it? Uh, <laughs> now, if that isn't professorial... The, 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 the inspiration of Daniel in an age of relativism. So, why would a mathematician spend his time in a book like Daniel? And you have to explain, again, for the benefit of people who do not know the book of Daniel, do not know the Bible, why is an Oxford mathematician doing that? 
Well, because I spent all my life thinking about the Bible. You see, when I went to Cambridge, I wanted to know where mathematics fitted in the big picture of science, where science fitted in the big picture of the universe. And because I became convinced very early on, mainly by the wonderful example of my parents, who stimulated me thinking about all kinds of worldviews, that Christianity was true, I therefore felt that you can take the Bible as seriously as you take your mathematics. I was very fortunate to have a brilliant mentor who was a professor of classics who introduced me to the classical world of thought and philosophy and who mentored me for about 50 years. And what he introduced me to was <clears throat> learning to take the Bible philosophically and intellectually seriously. Now, the book of Daniel, Daniel was a prophet that lived, I believe, in the sixth century BC. He was taken from uh, Judah to Babylon. Babylon was the great power. It was intellectually very advanced. You have in your arm evidence of Babylonian mathematics, 60 mm. seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour. Their engineering, their art, their music was absolutely brilliant. And here is this young believer in God found himself in King's College, Babylon. And obviously, he began to think about the significance of this vast culture. What could be wrong with it? And why hadn't his culture produced something like this? And over many years, I mean, I'm interested not only in Daniel, but in the whole of the Bible, but it occurs at a point where it appeared as if faith in God had reached a very low ebb. There's a believer in a vast culture, and yet, he rises to run two empires. Nobody in history has ever done that. And he, as an old man, starts to write about the big things he notices in life. And as I begin to analyze those and look at the thought flow of the literature of the text, I begin to realize that this is extremely powerful stuff. It is one of the most brilliant analyses of the nature of values that you'll find in any literature. And what I, uh, I have written the book about is to try to bring to a wider audience the idea that actually the Bible deals with the big questions of our time. Because I'm very concerned about the kind of notion that the Bible is a devotional book, it's over there, it's intellectually fairly trivial, and the culture's over here. And so when we've got a problem in the culture as Christians, we run to the Bible, we find a verse or two, and we run back. I want to take the Bible as literature and use it as a powerful searchlight to, to dig into the culture and throw up the ideas so that we can study what its answers are. And one of the reasons I believe that Scripture is the Word of God is not because I have a technical belief, but because of the sense it makes. And when I became convinced that Scripture had more to say than all other philosophies, that completely changed my life. And that's been the leading motive. So for the first time, I've had a chance to write about it, and that's why I've done it. I look forward to reading this. Um, wow. <laughs> a question, JP. Yeah. Uh, I had a chance to, to read uh, John's book and look at it before it came out. And I, I want to reinforce one of the points in the book that I, I want the people online and here to, he, to, to listen to. Uh, John makes the point that when Daniel was living in a culture that was pluralistic and increasingly hostile to the religion of Israel, he did not express his discipleship to the God of the Bible by privatizing it and being devotionally connected to God. He had to be a publicly engaged person where he engaged the ideas and the art and the other things of his culture that he was capable of engaging, or he would have been derelict in his discipleship. And, and, and th thank you, but I, thank, thank John. Um, but but, thank the, but the point that, that grieves me so badly and, and, you know, I've given the last 40 years of my life to this, and, and yeah, just, it, it really grieves me, it, is when I 
see the body of Christ um, overemphasizing the, the personal piety and uh, the, the affective aspects of the faith, which I believe in deeply. Those are crucial. But at the expense of helping people become public and to learn how to dialogue and engage with the issues of our time from a biblical perspective that makes sense to people. And, and, and we've, got to, we've got to do that more or else we're not going to win this thing. Then to that end, I want to stay with you. Mason Friesen, again, hashtag God's science. Is intelligent design compatible with evolutionary theory? Um, it depends on what you mean by evolutionary theory. Um, uh, Michael Behe is a, a, an evolutionist in the sense that he believes in common descent, that, that organisms came, uh, changed into later organisms by natural processes. But where he parts company and is an advocate of intelligent design is that he believes that the organisms that were made that way bear the stamp of intelligent activity leading up to them. So theistic evolution uh, can be defined in two or three different ways. One of them is a contradictory definition, and that is to define it as a guided, unguided process, because <laughs> evolution is, is considered to be an unguided process, and the theistic evolutionist says it's a guided, unguided process. That's a little tough to choke down. Uh, another way to define it is that it's not a guided process, and indeed God does, did not know what the outcome would be. Um, the other view is, no, God did guide evolution as long as his activity can't be detected. You know, now, try that with answer to prayer for a minute. I mean, God's allowed to answer prayers as long as you can't know he did it. That, that's, I don't know if that's a good way to go about this. But the point is that Behe thinks that there are clear evidences of intelligent causation at the back of the process, so he would not be a theistic evolutionist. Now, there are others who would say that God created at different points in the process because the natural materials themselves couldn't bridge that gap. But what makes an intelligent design person an intelligent design person is primarily the commitment to the scientific detectability of personal causation of a divine sort in the data of science itself. And that, therefore, God's action becomes a positive explanatory, uh, uh, has a positive explanatory power, and it's not a God of the gaps argument because there are positive reasons for thinking that divine agency was here. We don't say God must have done this because we have no other explanation. No, there are positive criteria that have been developed to detect it. So whether they're compatible depends on what you mean by theistic evolution. I would say generally not, except in a, in a very nuanced way. William Lane Craig, it is a mark of good, rigorous argument that you know the weakest part of your argument. And you know we're easy to attack the new atheists. But if the best trained new atheist was here, what's the hardest question to pose to this panel? Oh my goodness. I think it would be about the historical Adam and Eve. Um, in my discussions with population geneticists, the evidence seems to indicate that the pool of early humans never got below around 2,000 people, um, and that therefore the person who believes in an original human pair has got some real explaining to do. He's, he's got to show why the genetic models are mistaken, or at least that they're not um, certain enough to, to invalidate this. And here I'd like to pick up on something that JP mentioned that is very interesting. Um, JP mentioned that the so-called mitochondrial Eve from whom all living persons are descended and the chromosomal Adam that all humans are descended from were hundreds of thousands of years apart. Recently, these estimates have been redone. Yes, and so now they think they could be roughly contemporaneous. Which would be exactly yeah. in line with having an original 
mother and father of the human race. Now that doesn't explain the genetic evidence that I just talked about, but it would um, yes. say something very significant about the mitochondrial leave and the, the chromosomal atom actually Help being contemporaneous. Help me out with your first objection though, that the most talented new atheist would say, not can he change water into wine, but he said you don't really believe in an Adam and Eve. Am I understanding you correctly? Right. To which you respond, what, Dr. Lennox? Oh, I believe... <laughs> I believe that human beings are a supernatural creation, that there was an original two, and that is a very provocative thing to say. But I believe it, you see, because I think that there is strong evidence for more than the singularity at the Big Bang and so on. If I could just throw some light on it by referring back to what JP was saying. You asked about evolution and intelligent design. But you see, there's a presupposition behind evolution. I'm not a biologist. I'm a mathematician, so I'm interested in the presupposition. The presupposition, of course, is the existence of life. And Richard Dawkins fudged the thing for years in his book, The Blind Watchmaker, by saying that the Darwinian evolution was the explanation for the existence right. and variation of life. It isn't. And we need to get this absolutely clear. Evolution, whatever it does, and I've written a book and I'm very skeptical about a lot of things, I'm not going to go into them tonight, because whatever evolution does or doesn't do, it presumes the existence of a mutating, um, <clears throat> replicating DNA. Now, if you look at DNA as a black box, it's the longest word we've ever discovered. Computer science language is used to describe it. And the biologists were reluctant at the beginning to do this, but now they all accept it. Now, the very interesting thing is this, that a lot of the debate around this circles on the nature of explanation. What do we mean by scientific explanation? And it is a very common view that all explanation proceeds from the simple to the complex. And so you have all these evolutionary scenarios, which incidentally are being questioned these days by serious biologists, but I leave them aside. But you see, there's one area where the simple to the complex explanation does not work. And that is the area where language is involved. If you see your name written on Long Beach or something, four or five letters of your name, you infer immediately upwards to an intelligent input. No matter what mechanism put that there, you do that. Now, the fascinating thing, and I often uh, suggest it to my fellow professors, I say, look, you go into your laboratory and you see the DNA with 3.5 billion letters in exactly the right order, and I ask you, what's the origin of that? And you say, chance and necessity. <laughs> when? you'll see anything with language on it, four or five letters, and immediately you say intelligent input. Now, what I want to argue, and I do it on the basis of theoretical computer science as well, is that this isn't God of the gaps, that language at all levels demands intelligent input. But now the and that has is the key in. thing. The uh, atheist who is watching <clears throat> will say, that was beautifully put, and it was not responsive. Or a judge would say that. The question is, posed by uh, Bill, Adam and Eve are a problem. Your answer was, I believe in Adam and Eve, let's talk about the, uh, the improbability of, of DNA. It's non-responsive, let's talk about Adam and Eve. Are, are you saying that you can't explain Adam and Eve by science? No, what I'm saying is this. What I'm saying is the origin of life seems to me a clear singularity that is indicated by science. Now, if we're going to suggest 
that evolutionary processes produced human life, we've got to have a mechanism that increases complexity. I simply don't see it. Right. JP, do you, do you see why I'm saying it's not responsive? Well, <laughs> and, and the point I'm is, not going to answer that question. If, <laughs> this, this is a huge topic, you see. First of all, you have to map out exactly what it is Scripture claims. Now, I could be even more provocative in pointing out, it seems to me that what Scripture does is go as far as it can to indicate that humans don't come from other animals. Can I explain that for a minute? Floor's Number yours. one, the story goes like this, that human beings, man is created. This is the Genesis story. Then it says it is not good for man to be alone. And it talks about the animals that were brought to the human being to be named. And after that taxonomy, which is the beginning of science, of course, um, biology, taxonomy, the fundamental intellectual discipline, it makes the curious statement, but for man there was no help found answering to him. In other words, according to the Bible, the very first lesson humans were taught was that they were utterly distinct from all other animals. Point number two. When it comes to the creation of women, Hebrew could have told us. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Yes. And I've been married for 46 years to one, so that's okay. Um, <clears throat> point number two. Hebrew has many ways of stating that God made the female from an existent animal. But the text doesn't say that. It says that woman was made from man. Now that's going in the exact opposite direction of suggesting that Adam and Eve were products of some kind of random unguided process. Point number three. Well, I'm gonna buy that, but I gotta interrupt you because <laughs> Bill, I'm not hearing the answer to your objection. Has well, he now, answered it? Okay, now, I wanna be clear, Hugh. I didn't say this was my objection. And you said it was the best you, objection. You, you I asked the best me, objection answer. Right. You asked me where I thought that the skeptic would lodge his most effective attack. Yes, I did ask that. In terms of the reconciliation of Christianity and science. And I think that this would be one of those areas where conflict still remains and where there's still difficult work to and do. And so if, if an atheist watching this says, that's what those doggone Christians always do, they avoid the tough question. Oh. They don't answer it. Well, how do you answer it? Well, I'm not avoiding it. <coughs> um, I'm exposing myself to extreme ridicule, actually, <laughs> because I'm actually postulating a that, there, that there's a physical supernatural dimension. In other words, Perfect. God moves atoms. And what I'm very interested in is many of my friends who are theistic evolutionists have to say that at some point God intervenes to provide a soul. I'm going further than that. Now, science in a sense can't comment on that. We can, because this is a singularity. Well, all we can do is look at bones and all this kind of stuff. You're, you're, <coughs> okay, you're going to go back and say, oh, those Yanks are so <laughs> doggone rude. Uh, but, what, but, Yes, I'd, I'd like to address your question about the atheist saying that you're refusing to answer the question. Um, in fact, Christian anthropologists and geneticists and exegetes are working very hard on this. There's an enormous dialogue going on right now about this very issue, so it's, it's not being ignored. I myself, in my um, adult Sunday school class called Defenders had several lectures on this problem, and these are available on our website, reasonablefaith.org. If you want to look at what I think about this problem, look at the section on creation and evolution in the Defenders class. But the third thing that I would like to add, Hugh, is that I find it tremendously hypocritical that these same new atheists and scientists very frequently extol the virtue of science because scientists are not afraid to say, I don't know. 
and I have an open mind about this, and I don't have all the answers. Whereas religious people claim to have all the answers, they've got it all tidy and sewed up. Well, that's just hypocrisy. So what, what, what John was getting close to, uh, Stephen Jay Gold was a professor of mine and, and often a guest. Mm -hmm. So there were just different magisteriums. I'm sure you've heard this. There's science and there's faith. And he said, don't argue it. And I thought you were coming suspiciously close to driving into that ditch. Doctor. Oh, no, I disagree with Stephen Jay Gould. And I'm very interested in how you put it, science and faith. Faith in what? Because, you know, that actually, that formulation is an atheist formulation because the new atheists have very cleverly redefined faith. Faith is a religious term. It means believing where well, there's no evidence. I can give you a talk on science and faith that doesn't mention God, because faith is an essential part of science. And so I, that formulation is dangerous, but Gould is even more dangerous, oh. because he said, separate the two, never the twain shall meet. But if you read the subtext, religion deals with the tooth fairy yeah. and Santa Claus, That's right. and science deals with reality. All I'm saying is this, that just as in physics, we're forced to a singularity, and we need to open our minds to that possibility. I want to have my mind, while I read all the stuff, I'm not a biologist as I say, but I read the stuff, I want to open my mind to sit back and take seriously what Scripture actually says, and see, does that make sense? And since I find it makes sense of so much else, I'm prepared to keep my mind open on this particular yeah. question. I don't think it's the hardest question we face, though. Well, what is? What is? I want those. Oh, the problem of evil and suffering. Oh, but that's okay. not a scientific question. Oh, I question. say yes, okay. <laughs> Philosophical question. <laughs> uh, let, let me just add, I think JP wants yeah, to get in here too, but one of the assumptions um, of the genetic models that indicate that the human race was never below 2,000 individuals um, is that the mutation rate has been constant. And that's not evident. Uh, if the early mutation rates were variable, then you could have the population shrink down to below 2,000 people because the mutation rate hasn't been constant. So that is an enormous assumption for which there really isn't compelling scientific evidence and that would be one of the ways in which one might explore how to achieve a reconciliation of the biblical data that John talks about and the current evidence of population genetics. So yeah, two, two points that may help with this conversation. The first one is fairly easy to understand. Second will take a little effort. But first, you have to keep in mind that the kinds of criticisms that's, that there were ha the problems we're having with science deal with the early chapters of Genesis by and large. Uh, the, the main commitments of Christianity, science, m much science is providing support for. So if we focus on the evidence for God's existence, archaeological discoveries, and other historical finds that have helped undergird the reliability of the New Testament, then, then what we can say is those are, those are becoming, in my view, stronger, and they're bolted down, but there are problems, and most of them are really targeting the first ten chapters of Genesis, interestingly enough, which don't cut at the core of the Christian religion. Now, so the, that's the first point. The second point is this, and, and this may help you understand that what Bill is saying about Christians working on this is, is not distinctive to Christians because they've got, they don't want to give up their views. Um, I, I did a study of, of how people weigh and change theories, and one of the things I learned is that a theory of any kind, if it's an economic theory, a scientific theory, it could be a theological theory, uh, will have core commitments that are called the paradigm carriers. They're the key things to the theory. Uh, for, for Christianity, it's God and Jesus. And then there will be less important commitments that are around the periphery of the theory. Now, when does it become reasonable to think that an anomaly on the, on the periphery, a problem, turns out to really be 
a falsification of the theory as opposed to an anomaly that we can explain or we have to, we, we, it's okay for us to work on it over a while. And here's, here's what I think it is. If the evidence of the anomaly it outweighs the evidence you have for the paradigm carriers. In other words, if the evidence for the central part of the theory is stronger than the evidence that this falsifies the theory, then you are within your intellectual rights to say, I don't have an answer to this yet, but I can't bring myself to think it falsifies the theory, not because I don't want to, because we got a ton of evidence for this theory. I'll give you an example. In the 1800s, there was an organic chemical reaction called dehalohydrogenation. And the chemical reaction went the same way every time they used it, except with one chemical, it went the wrong way. And, and scientists, for I think it was close to 80 years, engaged in all kinds of ad hoc explanations to try to adjust the anomaly. Maybe our instrumentation wasn't good. Uh, they worked on it, and they said, frankly, we don't know what to do with this because uh, we have too much evidence that the theory of dehalohydrogenation is true. So they would not allow this to falsify the theory because they had too much evidence for the theory. They were not engaging in special pleading or, oh, I don't want to let go of my theory or anything like that. <laughs> uh, they, were, they were acting in an intellectually responsible kind of way. Now, eventually, they found out that there was another factor working in that particular reaction that drove it the other way, so it was not a good example of the theory, but that's not the point. The point is, and I'm talking a long time now, but the point is that if we have, as we all believe, a very strong case for Christian theism, and if we also believe that the Bible has proven itself to be reliable and true in so many cases, then we come to something like this, and we're not just burying our heads in the sand or saying, Oh, we don't want to believe the Bible's false. We're doing the intellectual responsible thing and saying we have a few ideas of how to explain this. Uh, try this on. But, you know, we might not know yet, but we're working on it. And that's a permissible thing to do. Now, that would, that would take me to Luke. And I have believed for a long time that he's the best of the ancient historians. That any kind of textual group of proof was, you would say, Luke did his job better than anyone. I've heard that explicated now from a lot of very smart people. What makes the gospel account more reliable, and I'm going to a question, why Christianity and not other nonsense religion? Let me rephrase that. Why Christianity and its claims and not other sacred scriptures, say the Quran or any of the other claims? Why Christianity? Three reasons. Uh, there are three reasons for selecting Christianity, and I could toss in a fourth. Number one, you ought to pick a religion whose depiction of God harmonizes with what we know about God from the creation. We have several arguments about God's existence uh, that we've offered, and they don't just give evidence God exists, but monotheism is true. So you ought to pick a monotheistic religion, not because the Bible teaches it, but because the creation is best explained by monotheism. So Buddhism and Hinduism are out. Uh, Islam is still in the running, Judaism, a vague deism, and so on. Second, pick a religion that does the most profound job of diagnosing and solving the human condition cross-culturally. And you can identify things I, I, I've got a list of 10 to 12 of these that I think Christianity does a far better job of addressing them than any other religion. Third, pick a religion for which there is, uh, there's evidence that it had supernatural backing when it began and continued. And with the New Testament, we have the evidence of fulfilled prophecy and good historical evidence that the Gospels were early and some of the Little hymns in the New Testament were very, very early and had Jesus already, uh, you know, being worshipped and so on. But, the, uh, you know, Muhammad says, I went into a cave and came out with a good bit of the Quran, not all of it. And uh, trust me, you know, and, and I just, that's why. And then the other one would be, pick Christianity because it's got Jesus. Now, you might think, well, I'd expect that from a Christian. But the fact is, he's the big enchilada and all the other religions want a piece of his action. So everybody... <laughs> Everybody, uh, no, everybody claims him, 
as one of theirs. Well, I'm saying, why, why get a watered-down, distorted piece of the deal? If, you're, if you say you like meat and you're willing to chow down on an old three-day-old stale hot dog uh, and I offer you steak, you're not a meat lover. You're a stale hot dog lover. Well, if you're going to go with that religion that's got this watered-down, stale picture of Jesus and I give you a steak, which is the Gospels, and you say no to it, you're not a God seeker, in my opinion, after you give people time to get over their culture and stuff. So that would be my... This comes out of that from Brian O'Neill. Again, the hashtag is God science. To what extent should the Bible be used as a source of scientific truth? So, Dr. Lennox. If we mean the natural sciences, as distinct from science in the continental sense, all knowledge, ah. then it's quite obvious that the Bible is not a textbook of science. I don't teach algebra from Leviticus. <laughs> <laughs> and <clears throat> what I would say is that although Stephen Jay Gould is wrong, separating the two completely out, the hard and fast, and it's, it's, it needs modification, but <clears throat> science, natural sciences, tend to deal with the how questions. And of course, we need to realize <clears throat> in a discussion like tonight that 99.9% .9 of the natural sciences are not talking about questions that raise the God issue. Absolutely. We can get a very skewed idea of science if we think it's always talking about origins and God and so on. It isn't. They're asking the how questions and the why questions of function. Whereas Scripture addresses the teleological questions, the big why questions. Now, I would modify that slightly in saying this, <clears throat> that although Scripture says relatively little about the how of creation, it does say something. Mm -hmm. And what it says is highly significant. Uh, people often say to me, the Bible's useless. It makes no scientific predictions. Well, I have two things to say about that. One is that <clears throat> if you believe Scripture, you could predict that science could be done. And indeed, that's what happened in the 16th and 17th centuries because the early pioneers of science believed in God, they believed in a rational universe, and therefore they believed it was worthy of study. But secondly, as I pointed out in a very famous um, physics institute, which must be nameless, um, <clears throat> not long ago, I said, you know, some physicist who's very well known said, Professor Lennox, you're not suggesting, are you? Please tell me you're not suggesting that the Bible has anything relevant to say to a 21st century scientist. I said, well, here's one thing. For centuries, what goes in the name of science was dominated by the Aristotelian view of the universe, that um, <clears throat> there was no beginning. Now, I said, the Bible has been saying there's been a beginning for centuries, in fact, for thousands of years. And let me just make the gentle suggestion to you that if you'd taken the Bible more seriously earlier, you might have looked for evidence for a beginning much earlier. <laughs> the final point is this. <clears throat> what fascinates me about the statements about creation, which are few in number, is that they have a central emphasis. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, the Word was God. All things came to be. It's an existence statement through the Word. In other words, this idea of Word Logos is primary. Mass energy is derivative. That is a colossal claim because it bangs straight in the face of materialism. Secondly, the unpacking of that in Genesis, and God said, and God said, and God said, is very simple language. But it seems to me it's raising one of the most profound issues of all, and it's central to the debate. Is this universe a closed system of cause and effect? And it's saying, no, it's an open system, and it was created stepwise by God feeding in input of energy 
and information from the outside of the system. That is phenomenally profound. Sometimes when I mention this to my atheist friends, they say, and I remember one famous astrophysicist, where they mentioned it to, he said, you're not telling me, are you, that the Bible is the concept of information? And I say, what does it look like? And he said, well, does Sir Fred Hoyle know about this? And I said, I don't know. So he told him. And that's another story. But the point is that <clears throat> I would suggest that the economy of the Bible, but in its concentrating, that this universe is word-based, is running convergent with the increasing insight of modern physics and theoretical computer science that information is a fundamental quantity that is not reducible to physics and chemistry. I mean, the irony of our materialistic age is information, however we define it, and it's difficult, is not material. And if that's a fundamental quantity that is not producible by physics and chemistry, which is Thomas Nagel's difficulty, that's the end of materialism. So what the Bible does suggest on this score is very important, but then, it isn't a textbook of science. Then, <coughs> from, it's wonderful how these things are timely. That's because people are watching and saying, them in. I'll send this to you, David Lakegren. Can incompatibility, William Lakegren, incompatibility with Christianity serve as a criterion of falsification for scientific theory? Hmm. Well, you could say that it would serve as a criterion of falsification of Christianity with equal justice. This was the point JP was making about having these central um, core beliefs in one's theory and then these auxiliary beliefs that um, could be given up and yet the core being maintained. But there's nothing wrong with the way David posed the question. Can incompatibility with Christianity serve as a criterion of falsification for scientific theories? Well, did, I, I, again, I go back to what JP said. If you've got really good grounds for believing that a Christian world and life view is true, then if there is an incompatibility with science, that would give you some reason for thinking that there's a scientific error here that will be uncovered given enough time and enough work on it. So, yes, in that sense. Do you agree with that? Oh, oh absolutely. And in fact, that's, um, that's central. Can you hear me? Not very well. All right. Um, John Lennox, did you cut off my microphone? Okay. All right. Um, um, uh, this is central to my own work because, look, the Bible seems to me to be really clear that animals and humans have souls. Now, I've read all the people who think that it doesn't say that, but, but it's, uh, their arguments are weak in my view. So let's grant that for the sake of argument. Well, then, I approach the philosophical field of philosophy of mind and neuroscience with a prior, uh, uh, what I believe to be warranted commitment to the soul, and I try to find independent reasons for that that don't depend on the Bible. Because I assume if this is true, I will be able to find independent grounds for it, and I see if I can find answers against it. So, for example, many of the claims that are made by neuroscientists today, and I'm going to be lecturing on this to a group of scientists coming up here this spring in Pittsburgh, that neuroscience has almost nothing to do with the mind-body problem. Almost nothing. Uh, the, the central issues are theological and philosophical. Let me give you an example. Would you uh, explain the mind-body problem? Yeah, it's, am I one thing, a physical thing, say my brain and body, or am I more, or, or am I more than one thing, like, like a soul and a body, or is my consciousness real and different than my brain states? So, uh, they, there are three views. One is that I'm totally physical. The second is my consciousness is not physical, but it's in the brain. And the third view is that my consciousness is not physical and it's in the soul. Now, there are these things called mirror neurons. Bill's heard me talk about this, but they've discovered that if a part of your brain is damaged so that your mirror neurons can't fire, then you, it, you are not able to feel empathy for other people. Now, what follows from that? The answer is nothing. 
because the three theories I gave you are empirically equivalent, which means that they're consistent with the very same neuroscientific fact. Theory one, a feeling of empathy just is the same thing as the firing of neurons in the brain. Number two, a feeling of empathy is a irreducible mental property that's not physical, but it's caused by firings of uh, mirror neurons, and they're both in the brain. Both the feeling of empathy and the mirror neuron firing are in the brain. Theory three, uh, the, the feeling of empathy, when it happens, is in the soul. The firing of mirror neurons is in the brain, but the soul won't work if the brain doesn't work. So if there's a problem with the mirror neurons firing, the soul can't have a feeling of empathy. Now those are three different views, but they're consistent with the same scientific data. And so what troubles me, and this needs to be said before we quit here this evening, many of the things that scientists say are actually philosophical assertions. Uh, and, 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 and when they come to report on their view or make claims, honest, this is the truth, I'm not just saying this, if you look at the substance, they're not sticking with data or trying to understand data, they're making philosophical extrapolations for which they're not trained. So when people in my field say neuroscience has pretty much shown there's no evidence that there's a soul, I just, I either get really hacked off or start laughing, one of the two. Depends on if I've had a glass of wine or not. But, um, <laughs> but, but um, it, 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 it absolutely makes no sense because there's no scientific evidence that could count in favor of one of those three theories. Right, so, so they're philosophically decidable. We have 15 minutes left. So I want to make sure we get to the core question, which is, in the West, it appears that faith is cratering in at least the heart of the West, Europe. And I asked Dr. Lennox this earlier. Is that because science is cratering it or because the cultural assumptions about science are cratering it? Bill. Wow. I'm not a sociologist. And so that is a very difficult question to answer. I think that in Europe, ever since the Enlightenment, the association of the church and the monarchy has prejudiced people against religious faith because they belong to the old order, the ancien regime that was overthrown in the Enlightenment. And when you got rid of the monarchy in favor of democracy and human autonomy, you threw off the church as well. And ever since then, there's been this advance in secularism in Europe. I think this has been augmented by religious wars, by the Second World War, the First World War, um, that has left that country spiritual, or that nation, or, or rather uh, continent, spiritually devastated. By contrast, in North America, and especially in the United States, I think we can be very thankful for the separation of church and state that exists here, because the um, religious faith of Christianity flourishes and grows independently of the state and therefore is not associated with it and, and the old regime. So I see this, I guess, as due mainly to these sorts of sociological factors and not due to the advance of, of science. The, That's very reassuring. It's not science, it's the culture that thinks of science as being anti-faith. Yes. Do you agree with that, John Lennox? To a very large extent, I do. I think that the new atheists who are on the wane, really, we've now got the new, new atheists. <laughs> um, the new atheists were, were very vocal and very aggressive. And the claim was, for example, in the cover of Der Spiegel a few years ago, God's to blame for everything. And the Dawkins analysis was 9-11 radicalized me. In other words, the simplistic analysis was that's religion, it's unacceptable, we got to get rid of it. If you say that's extreme religion, well, yes, but extreme religion thrives on the periphery of moderate religion, so the whole lot has to go. And so you got at the conference at La Jolla five or six years ago, Steven Weinberg, who won the Nobel Prize, saying the best thing that scientists can do 
for religion in this generation is to get rid of it. So there's certainly a strong element of that. And <clears throat> we mustn't underestimate the colossal influence that books like The God Delusion have had on young people. Now, I think this whole sociological element is playing in with it. But <clears throat> I'm encouraged to a certain extent that many, many young people are getting a bit fed up. And indeed, many of my atheist friends are getting fed up with the, that kind of strident, militant attitude. And if you put um, extreme Islamists in the same category as the Amish, you're not actually doing intellectual uh, thinking uh, a service. So that it's on the wane, and it's a very, very complex mix. If you ask in the UK why people leave the churches, the main BBC conclusion is they don't answer our questions. So I think that's an enormous challenge to the Christian church to get out there and listen to what people to ha have to say, listen to their worldview, and try to help answer their questions. JP, and then I have a last question with two minutes or each. Yeah, two. years ago I went to a small gathering of 20 people where I was going to give an evangelistic presentation in a home, and a lot of non-Christians came. I was at the hors d'oeuvre table. Uh, I was warned about a, a physicist with a PhD in physics from Hopkins, and uh, sure enough, he came in and made a beeline over to me at the hors d'oeuvre table, and, he, and I shook his hand, and he said, well, say, first thing he said to me, I hear you're a philosopher and a theologian, and I said, well, you know, I give it my best shot. And, and he, he said, you know, I used to be interested in that when I was a teenager. But when I matured, I outgrew it because I came to, I came to know that if you can't quantify it and measure it in the lab and test it empirically, it can't be known. Now, what he was asserting was scientism, not science, and there are different versions of scientism, but the main danger we've got, again, is scientists making statements out of their field. He was making an epistemological claim, a claim about the nature of knowledge, for which he had no training. And uh, if he would just stick to the science, I think we'd all be better off. But the trouble is, the guys with the lab coats are so, they're the priests of the culture, and they feel like they can say anything about anything and nobody stands up to them. And a philosopher sure can't do it, because philosophy is psychology misspelled today to most people. <laughs> so, um, but why then, Yeah. why did they win at all, even if they're not presently winning? Why wouldn't the truth claims of a true system have overwhelmed people who are simply on a cultural jihad against folks they don't like? Well, I think, that, I think the best book on that question is Julie Rubin's book. At, she's a Harvard professor called The Making of the Modern University. And she traces uh, the American University from 1880 to 1930 and shows how scientific naturalism replaced Christian theism. Uh, in the university, and it was largely for sociological reasons. Right, my last question, uh, I want to conclude by where we were six years ago. And I'll start with you, uh, William Lane Craig, and then go back in with JP. Hitchens was arguing that the evidence for the irrationality of any religious belief was everywhere because the violence of religion was everywhere. He would be pointing today to ISIS and to the accumulating evidence of, of a terrible crisis in the world having to do with religious fanaticism. So how in the world does the scientific truth of the rise in fanaticism get repudiated by an appeal to the Bible when, in the eyes of the world, that's the problem right now? Yeah. It seems to me, as I said then, Hugh, that you cannot invalidate a worldview based upon the failure of adherence of that worldview to live consistently with the teachings of that worldview. As John said earlier, Jesus would not be implicated in these kinds of acts. He wouldn't have led the Crusades or the Inquisition. He wouldn't conduct jihad. Um, and the fact that religious zealots of all different sorts of stripes engage in these sorts of activities does absolutely nothing to 
impugned the truth of the teachings of Jesus of Nazareth. He, he himself could not be indicted for these sorts of things. So I think that while this may be a great emotional difficulty for people in our culture to overcome, philosophically, it's just insignificant. It, it does not do anything to show that God does not exist, that he has not raised Jesus from the dead, and that salvation and eternal life is not available through faith in Christ. Those, the, these uh, abuses of religion don't do anything to undercut those truths. In fact, on a Christian view of the fallenness of man, we ought rather to expect such abuses of religion because it's so symptomatic of a fallen humanity that it would take the best and the most beautiful things and twist them into ugly, misshapen forms. Dr. Lennox? Uh, I come from Northern Ireland and therefore I'm familiar with religious violence. I had very unusual parents who were Christian without being sectarian, which meant that they employed in their store both Protestants and Catholics, and they were bombed f for it. My brother nearly lost his life. So I'm familiar with it, and when people ask me how I respond to it, I say I'm utterly ashamed of it. I'm utterly ashamed that the name of Christ was ever associated with an AK-47 or a bomb, and the reason is what Bill has just explained. One of the central historical features of the New Testament is the trial of Jesus. It is crucially important. And I discussed this actually with the late Christopher Hitchens. I said, Christopher, I agree with you. This is the unacceptable face of religion, but don't you realize it's the charge of fomenting political violence that put Jesus on trial in the first place? He was accused of terrorism, to put it in modern language. And the, the important thing is that historically, when Pilate investigated him, he knew, of course, that Jesus had not resisted arrest, and when Simon Peter took a sword to swipe the head off the high priest's servant, he wasn't very good, and he cut his ear off. Now, by the way, if I might say something about that, I believe Jesus put the ear back on, but you would be very poetically dim not to see what's being said. If you take up weapons to defend Christ or his message, you cut the ears off people in a big way. And that's why your question is coming. <clears throat> and so, if you're a Christian here tonight, I commend to you the ministry of putting ears back on yeah. Yeah. so that people can actually hear the message. Now, Pilate had heard that. And then he asked the question, are you a king? What kind of a king? Well, my kingdom is not of this world, <coughs> otherwise my servants would have been fighting. There was the answer. And then he said something highly significant. He said, to this end was I born, and to this end I came into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. And Pilate said, what is truth? Now, I don't think he was cynical, but what he realized as he went out to declare Jesus innocent was this, that the one thing you cannot do by violence is to impose truth, especially if it's the truth about forgiveness and peace with God. So that's one side of it, but there's another very big side that is suppressed. It's most interesting reading atheist literature in this. You see, Richard Dawkins loves to cite the song Imagine by John Lennon. Do you remember that? Imagine a world without religion. Well, I'm not John Lennon, I'm John Lennox. <clears throat> and I've written a song called Imagine. I'm not going to sing it. But it's Imagine a world without Hitler, Paul, Potter, Mao. What about that world? Well, you don't hear anything of that from the new atheists. In fact, they airbrush out the whole of 20th century history. Now, there isn't any excuse 
for a single murder in the name of Christ. But when you look at the bloodbath in the 20th century that is directly traceable to atheist regimes and philosophies, anything that happened over those centuries in the name of Christianity is utterly tiny. Atheism has consequences. And you know, Richard Dawkins and others try to say, well, Stalin was in seminary and Hitler was a Christian. They've never been to Eastern Europe. You imagine. Uh, Dawkins' ignorance of history when he says, I can't imagine an atheist who would blow up a cathedral like Charter Notre Dame. Uh, a rather clever East German journalist said, no, Ulbricht and Stalin didn't use bulldozers. Cathedrals are too big for bulldozers. They use dynamite. Hmm. And I've stared into many holes in the ground in Russia where there were churches. 50,000 priests Stalin killed. And Alexander Solzhenitsyn, when he came to America, that famous address, he said, if I were asked why 100 million of my fellow citizens had to perish, my short answer is, we have forgotten God. That's the unacceptable face of atheism. The last question goes to you, JP. Um, the, the speech he just referenced, I was in the audience for 35 years ago, and uh, it was my commencement speech, and Solzhenitsyn thought we had lost, but in fact the Soviet Union had lost. You wrote in the oak and the calf, all you have to do is push a stick through it. Has the new atheism lost, and they just don't know it yet? Yeah, I, I think it's, I, I wouldn't want to put it in those terms. Um, because I think we know at the end of the day, ultimately we're going to win, but there will be losses if my view of human freedom is correct. Uh, because I believe that the net balance of good and evil at the end of the world, when Christ comes back, is contributed to by human action. And so there can be genuine losses. I think there's been huge losses in Europe for a long time. And I think that there could be losses in America. I want to be more precise then. Have the atheists made arguments from science that defeat Christianity thoroughly so that a young person doesn't want to go to a Biola University because yeah. they don't want to waste their time with truth claims made by a yeah. disproven and archaic yeah. religion? People in the academy don't take the new atheists seriously because their writings aren't that sophisticated. They're popularizers. Uh, Dawkins work, uh, if it were judged philosophically, would be about a C plus. And um, seriously, so no. In fact, I find their I find their work to be react a reaction to the growth of Christian philosophy and apologetics. I actually think they're reacting to the wave of stuff that's been coming from our side. So uh, absolutely not. And I think there are good days ahead for us, but we have to keep working at it. For those who want that wave, as our time is out, you go to Biola University, biola.edu or simply go to the hashtag God Science and follow your nose. Would you please join me in thanking our distinguished panel?